Hello and welcome to the Techno Warriors Advanced FTC Team 3486 informative presentation on joystick code. My name is Jacob Mason and I've been the programmer for the Techno Warriors Advanced for the past four years. Today I'd like to detail a method by which you can get more accurate movements in telop mode, also called the driver control period. Before we get started, know that this code is for tank drive styled robots, not arcade style. Although I'm sure our bright student out there could easily modify this for the arcade mode robots. I refer to the scaling method as the exponential scale. In your sample programs, you'll find a program titled tankarcade.c, which uses a logarithmic scale. Now this scale creates a similar curve to that of an exponential equation. So instead of explaining how this intricate piece of code works, I will show you the program I wrote after being inspired by this as this one is pretty difficult to understand. This particular piece of code was written by the Benson Robotics Club, so great job to that team. If you'd like to learn more about logarithmic scales, I suggest you check out this video from Khan Academy, the link to which you'll find in the description. The most common problem of joystick code is that the robot lacks accurate movement. It moves too fast for subtle movements like retrieving batons or rings, or lining up to score wiffle balls. Now the most common joystick codes are direct input, division, or button swapping. Direct input is where a drive motor, or any other motor for that matter, is assigned the value of the joystick controller. The second option you see is commonly found in many of the templates. However, it only forces the robot to perform an unnecessary read-write sequence by writing the value of the controller and then referencing it only a line later. Direct input, along with any other method of scaling, can actually be combined with a joystick threshold using an if-else structure. There is, however, still a severe problem with this method of joystick control. Direct input does not scale the input from the joysticks to match the output. To demonstrate this, we can graph this equation. Direct input can be represented by the equation f of x equals x, or just y equals x, where X is our joystick input, and the result Y is the output sent to our tech to drive motors. On a TI-83+, Plus, I created a box that contains the domain and range of our joysticks and motors respectively. The domain of X, which is the joystick input, is simply negative 127 to positive 127. The range of Y, the power of the motor, will be from negative 100 to positive 100. As we can see, our linear function reaches the ends of the ranges far before x reaches the ends of its domains. In other words, when the joystick is greater than 100 or less than a negative 100, the motor is running at full strength. And even if we move the joysticks further, the motors won't do anything because they're already running at full strength. We're losing the additional 27 on both ends of the joystick, which is a little over 21% of our joystick's range of motion. However, with the most common method of scaling, simple division, we can use the end bands of our joystick. In this equation, I divided the input by 1.27. Now, this is actually a simplification of a division by 127 and then a multiplication by 100. It works because we're creating a percentage. X can only get as large as 127. So, when we divide it by 127, we have a fraction that represents the percentage of joystick power, so to speak. That fraction is only going to range from negative 1 to positive 1. So, when we multiply it by 100, we're just using our fraction as a percentage of 100. If that doesn't make too much sense, just know that this method makes the robot send a power of 100 or negative 100 only if you have the joystick pressed all the way forwards or backwards. This method is obviously better than direct input, and the single math operation the robot has to do is unnoticeable in terms of delay. Often used in combination with division is a button swapping system. Many teams do this, and I would consider it to be the most popular and easiest thing to program. Button swapping is where one changes the scaling factor from 1.27 to something like 2.54. Since the denominator is larger, we're shrinking the end result. This shrink results in a divided range, as is illustrated by the graph. We can also run the maximum joystick values 
through each of the division factors. When we divide by 1.27, we get 100, which is expected. And when we divide by 2.54, which is just 1.27 multiplied by 2, we get 50, which is obviously half of 100. Well, I've used the button swapping system for three years, and it does work well, and it's certainly efficient. But there is a better way. Linear scaling is the problem. Have you ever noticed that the robot just goes from 0 to 100 even when using division? That's because Tetrix motors are generally unresponsive when given values below 15 or even 20, depending on the weight of the robot. This means you have to move your joystick to a little over the 25 position to even get any movement. This isn't true with lighter robots, but the theory here is still important because we know that we are again, losing some of our joystick's range. About 20% actually. Then, there is a noticeable difference between values like 80 and 100 because when you're going 80 power, you're moving too fast to align to something, so you're probably trying to go really fast to get across the field. Now this is another 20% or so on the end of that range. All of these seemingly negligible things add up to create the common problem we all have, that is refined movement. Today, I'm going to show you how to use an exponential equation to solve this issue. A modified exponential scale will give us more fine-tuned movements in the areas we need them in. Now for this part, I'm going to use MathCAD Prime 2.0 to demonstrate, analytically and graphically, how to create and understand the exponential equation we're going to use for the joysticks. Okay. So now we're here in MathCAD, and this is the division version of motor scaling. I've changed one thing, however. Instead of dividing by 1.27, I've divided by 127 and then multiplied by 100. Remember, 127 over 127 is 1, which is kind of obvious. And we use this fact to create our scale. Anything over 127, that's always going to be 1 or negative 1 or somewhere in between. When we multiply this by 100, we get our nice scale. So all we have to do to get to the exponential version is simply square the tops and bottoms of our fraction. So what I've done here, since x is squared, I tested the maximum value, 127. When that's squared, we can see that whatever this is is going to cancel out and I'm going to get 1. However, we've created a problem, and that's when any negative value is input for x, it becomes squared. So we are losing our sign. Everything is positive. We need to be able to fix that. So how we fix this is by multiplying by another fraction, x over the absolute value of x. Remember that x is our joystick. So the maximum value our joystick can attain is 127. Now if we're dividing x by x, we know that's 1. So the absolute value just keeps this bottom part positive. 127 is already positive, so this one's unmodified. It's going to equal 1. However, in the negative range, the absolute value keeps the denominator positive, and we get a negative number, negative 1. So this is multiplied by negative 1, and that's why we get our curve going down and give negative power to our motors. Now, if you ran this and tested it, you would find a problem. That's because 50, even decently up our joystick scale, almost a halfway, is still going to equal 15.5 for our motor output. Now, in terms of Tetrix motors, 15.5 is a very small number, and we need to fix that. So values for our function are starting out too low. So we can do something to fix this, and it's called an outside change. For those of you who've taken Algebra 2, this kind of thing should be moderately familiar. An outside change to x just means that after all of this multiplication, we're going to have an addition of 20. This makes sense. If no matter what value we have, we just add 20, we're going to get just 20 more power. Of course, you can see this creates obvious problems. The first of all being negative values 
given in the joystick will equal positive values for a while, and that's demonstrated here um, numerically again. That's because this positive 20 is going to go the wrong direction for these negative values. How we fix this is we simply do the same trick we did to solve our last problem. We need another x divided by the absolute value of x. When we do this, the second half, the negative portion, breaks from the first line and gives us negative values. And you can see here that now we have the same power value for the tested number of 5, just in negative. And that's what we want. Now, it's absolutely vital that you test your robot to find the value of your outside change. You see, this is dependent on robot weight. Our threshold is 5 on our joystick, meaning that when our joystick goes outside 5, it actually starts sending data to the motors instead of having it just equal to 0. So 20 is the power needed to get our robot to start moving. However, on lighter weight robots, this will probably need to be a little less. So change that accordingly by making 20 less, or if you need more power, make 20 greater. Most often times, you'll likely need less than 20. Something like 15 will probably do the trick. So once again, x over the absolute value of x has saved the day by correcting our values by including the sign of x. Now we see that we've created a new problem. This point on our graph should be hitting the points where 127 on our x and our 100 on our y are crossing, but it's not. And this makes sense. We've added 20 and shifted it up, and we haven't scaled it back out again. So on this graph, I've expanded the range of x so we can see where our line is going over. Now, it makes sense that when we test our value for 127 on our x, we're getting a result of 120. Because in here, we were getting values of 100. Well, now we've added a 20, so this point is 120. Now, we can't get rid of that by subtracting 20. That would defeat the whole purpose of our addition here that's bringing these ends up. What we can do, however, is correct some of our equation in here. Now, there is logic to this that you'll just have to follow, and that's whatever this value is, you subtract that from 100. So I'm going to modify my original equation by taking 100 and turning it to 80, which is the difference. Once I modify it to 80, you'll see that my corners magically line up and my equation has become perfect. But I do want you to know why we can just subtract 20 from 100 and get the right values. So in this equation, everywhere there's been an x, I've just substituted the maximum value that x can be, which is 127. So for this first part here, 127 squared over 127 squared is just going to 1. Here, 127 over the absolute value of 127 also goes to 1. Over here, we have 127 over the absolute value of 127 again, which is another 1. And now we're only left with our 100 and our 20. So this entire expression is just equal to 100. This entire expression is just equal to 20. And that's why we have that 120 instead of the 100 we're looking for. So all we have to really do is make this value 100 and this value 20 add to equal 100, and that's by changing this 100 down to an 80. So when we change that to an 80, we get our 80 plus 20, which is 100. And that's why we know to just subtract 20 from whatever this is. So now that we have our function, we're left with just one other thing, and that's to transform it into code. I use robot C, and for robot C users, I can give at least one warning, 
At the time at which I created this function, robot C had problems processing the equation unless only one operation was run per line. Also remember that when handling large numbers, we still need to use longs instead of integers, at least until the numbers get small enough to handle. You can download the robot C template for this on our website, for which a link might be found in the description. I hope that the technique described within this presentation will give you a leg up in competitions. If you have any questions, please email us at technowarriors at yahoo.com. Also, visit our website at ftc-team-3486.wikispaces.com. There you'll find our engineering notebook where we post revelations like this one every week. Thanks for watching, and from all of the Techno Warriors, I wish you good luck.